Here we are. All right, so I'm here with Griffith Morgan, uh, independent filmmaker, a maker of the 2019 documentary uh, Secrets of Blackmore, which is a history on the beginning of role-playing games on the Blackmore campaign in the, the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. So I'll let him uh, take it from there and explaining what the film was about and uh, how he went about uh, the gathering uh, information and research to create this uh, film. Uh, thanks, Otto. Um, I, uh, I don't know. There's not much else. Can I uh, I'm a film maker. My real interest is in uh, abstract expressionist film, which is totally different from do documentaries. And uh, I just stumbled into doing research on it. And I had studied some of the and uh, archaeology, kind of a history buff. Like all gamers, especially war gamers, are history buffs. So um, we, my partner, I just showed him all the research and, and started calling people. And, and uh, next thing we knew, we were on our way to the Twin Cities. We detect everything. It was about, I don't know, like maybe 10 grand on our first trip. Just as a, it was really just a lark, just to see if anything is there to make a movie out of. <laughs> and then uh, we spent the next six and a half, altogether six and a half years making the movie. And um, I mean, that's it, you know. And so in the end, we ended up with about a two hour long, it's over two hours long. It's a, it's a kind of a research document. It's very fluffy as far as like, uh, like something you'd see on the History Channel or something like that. It's more like old school PBS documentary. It makes sense to you at all auto. And what is uh, kind of, uh, I guess, the big discovery, the things that uh, people might not have known that uh, you, you uncovered? Because, I mean, you call it secrets there. What was being uh, hidden from yeah. the general public? Well, you know, there was a book out already that kind of covered a lot of the things. Um, like with all historians, uh, historians like to argue the details. And, and so you go out and you find something and, and so you write about it in a certain way, but maybe you, uh, somebody else like me comes along and sees, see maybe a different, different bent on the story. And so I don't know if for some people, maybe we're not discovering anything not only new, but it's very much with a movie you can contextualize it a little bit more for people and so it was i mean as far as documents we found a lot of old documents that nobody's ever seen and stuff and we've been able to to make some there where we knew as far as like finding like the the first character sheet out of the twin cities gamers groups um the gamer, you know, characters like strength and intelligence and wisdom uh, attributes and there was a sheet for a Napoleonic campaign and Barnum was being leaders of or like the noble family um, even the children attributes and he would roll dice on different and what got sick maybe just got ill and died and it would change history during the game because they were doing uh, speculative a, a global a global campaign um, uh, in the Napoleonic era, which would have affected the history where anything happened, depending upon what the the pretend leaders were doing in the game. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of well. So I'm trying to think of I, I forgot where I started, but we basically what happens is is you you put a different spin on it and you enter the dialogue, which is kind of important part, or I think it's the most important part in in, in the scientific research and history, um, anthropology. Not really be right, but perhaps posing a different question or, or guiding people toward looking at things from a different perspective. My mind different meaning through, through applying different methods. Um, and then, for all you know, somebody's going to come along in 10 years and do something else and totally bunk the theory. But, but at least they, had, they sort of had the argument against you. It's kind of like the Hegelian spiral, you know. They, have theory and then you have the counter theory and then you merge the theory and the counter theory and now you've got a new theory 
it's kind of a recursion like that. You go off and, um, and do more research. <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, so we made the movie and we entered the dialogue and, and we done a real story of what role playing games are from the perspective of the people who actually originally invented them with the city gamers. Uh, so, so what is the, I guess, the basic narrative then? <laughs> it is my smoke is getting you, isn't it? Sorry, I'm smoking. No, no, no. I, I, I have. That's why I gotta take the pill. I had to quit smoking because I, I got a blocked artery from smoking too much nargila uh -huh. in the Middle East. Um, so, but what's the what are you saying about the narrative? As far as what is the so well, what, what is, is the what narrative is the of the narrative movie here? That uh, overarching because uh, on this show we talk a lot about uh, narratives, particularly the idea of redemption narratives. That is, you have heroic narratives and then victim narratives and then redemption narrative so it's kind of a, a dip you know you start you go up high then you go low and then you go up again in both uh, fictional and historical kind of constructions uh, you know so what is the historical the, construction here well i think the real historical construction is that um there's a tendency to look at all the information and 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 it, within the church community there's a tendency to look at all the information based on on documents and the the whole premise and methodology for role playing is thing that isn't necessarily documented. So you can look at documents and you never see role playing. Uh, so it was really necessary. Like the narrative from for me as a filmmaker, the narrative was that somebody needed to come along and apply uh, the, more of a cultural anthropologist, cultural anthropologist approach to to studying this in order to me about what, what is a role-playing game and how do these things evolve and um, if you look at I mean as a thing even things like if you look at ideas they sort of follow similar processes as, as like uh, genetics okay so um, there are certain idea bottlenecks and and if you look at different cultures that are isolated from each other or you look at something that was invented with culture I always like to look at uh, like Stonehenge, okay? It was invented a really long time ago. The people who made it knew what they were doing. Uh, it was some sort of a star tracking clock device. And then for thousands of years, nobody even knew what the thing was for. It was closed. Oh, There's stones out there and, you know, the druids and the little people or something. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but, but they look at, you know, so it, it's like you have, you have sort of lost knowledge like that, or else you look around the United States. I think I've seen where Native American, was, there are Native American cultures that have these stellar uh, calendar devices where they, they have a demarcation for, for a certain planet or a star or something. And they found these rings even in North America or found chambers in, in uh, the southern part of the United States that do similar things to Stonehenge. So, um, where am I going with all of this? Um, yeah, because uh, I ask, uh, um, perhaps the, the two things. One, you're getting really choppy, according to both my hearing and the uh, the chat. Really? Uh, but two, perhaps we could just focus on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the sound is is choppy. Why don't I just turn off my camera? That's what I was see if that to helps. Suggest. Sorry about people not being able to see me. It's okay. They, um, they've seen you, and the first person thought you were Bob Dylan, and the second person thought you were Einstein come from the dead. I'm kind of both of them, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you have these... these uh, uh, what, what, what is the, the narrative we're talking here for development of, of RPGs? Uh, so what's the standard narrative, the one that, well, that uh, you right found right. to be false? But you have these sort of genetic bottlenecks, and so one of the things I found was a lot of researchers were looking at things, and they just look at the entirety of the history, and and so they they do this little game where they hold up one thing, and they say, oh, it's like other thing that they must be there must be some sort of like a linear progression in time between these two things, and uh, what I find was, and that's why I was talking about the idea of like like 
uh, genetics and, and, and lost knowledge and ideas. Uh, you look at the Twin Cities gamers, one of the things that became very clear was that they only had one source. So, so it's sort of a genetic problem in terms of what they found called uh, Strategos. And the, the Strategos book was sort of their handbook for developing new ideas for how to play war games. And, and that included these concepts of free Kriegspiel versus rigid Kriegspiel, out of the Austrian school of wargaming, even before Totten. Um, but they didn't have those to look at. And they were, they were interpreting those concepts that were being handed down through Totten. And uh, so that's one of the discoveries we made all the, all of the stuff. Was we, we were in the last stretches. There's a... There's a, a, a line in Totten that, that Wesley sits, and um, it's something to the effect of a player should be allowed to do anything, although not always successfully. And so, so the idea is free, free, free spiel, credos, if you will, coming out of Totten is the idea that you can do anything you want in the role playing game or, or, or you know, any game that uses role playing. Um, so, um, can't really long did this stuff, and so you find you find Wesley citing that. We know the guys got the book in nineteen somewhere around nineteen sixty four. Um, we have evidence of that. We can we like we can we we have corroborated uh, states for people, different peoples that that are able to be dated that way. And then um, if you look at we're also on the movie. We had, we were just scrambling to get it out there. So it was just like, you know, the 14 hour days you're being gone. And um, I found, I was looking through the first fantasy campaign and I suddenly realized that Dave Arneson had cited to Matt. I didn't look at that book since I, I first bought it probably around 1978. And so suddenly I stumbled upon a citation of Houghton, even within Arneson's writings. And we find, uh, it's just, I mean, it's it whole thing concept. The whole the whole methodology really comes out of Totten, but it's really hard to cite Totten as being like inventorial, but he's certainly part of the equation. And so uh, that's kind of that's kind of the main news of the movies. Like, got the guy get together and they're using this old book, and and it somehow inspires them to create all these other games that ultimately end up. You know, and your guy acts becoming part of their the chain of, of uh, sharing of ideas and Dungeons and Dragons and push. How's uh, that for a short answer? Okay, yeah, well, it wasn't very short, but uh, yeah, I guess your your claim is that the Minneapolis was the and St. Paul is the, the real uh, intellectual uh, genesis of role playing games, uh, and that uh, Lake Geneva. Uh, came about later uh, after uh, Gygax well, uh, met up with yeah. Arneson and uh, his uh, gaming group. It's kind of, it's just so complicated because if you start to leave, um, uh, uh, like, I forgot what the term is. There's a term for, for, for reducing the standard of reminding details. I forgot what it's called, but um it always slips my mind, but anyway, if you get if you get really obsessive about the detail and you're looking at everything from my scope, you're not going to get the whole story. So, I think a lot of people will come away and they'll say, "Oh, like, well, no, it was on, oh no, it was the other guy, Wesley. Wesley was the guy that invented it because he created Brownstein, right?" Or they might come away and say, "Like, well, yeah, but without Darnison, you never had the role playing game." And then other people will say, "Like, without." Gary Gygax, you won't have the role playing game either. And it's sort of this, this, uh, there's a synergistic quality to the equation of how it happens where, where I think, I think most people said everybody was, was in that equation. And even if you look at the players that were playing in the games, they did things within games that forced the referees to do things to, to force the referees to compensate and deal with whatever the player was doing. Uh, and so that expanded the play method as well. Um, there's one there's one guy, Dwayne Jenkins, that was part of the group. And he ran... So do you know what a Brownstein is, actually? 
It, it's a brown rock, literally. <laughs> yeah, it's like brown. It's got like I think it's a, a, a beer stein is a brown stein. But um, um, what what obviously uh, created the game where everybody was interacting as an individual and everybody had different objectives, but the refereeing style is different from Dungeons and Dragons because it doesn't have that uh, all powerful referee that controls all of reality. Um, so he was doing that. And then, and then Dave Arneson also did some Brownstein games using Wesley's ideas. And then we had this guy came along, Dwayne Jenkins, and he started this cowboy and Indians sort of Western 1890s Western game called Brownstone, Texas. And it was a Brownstein, but what he did differently was he introduced the idea of the never ending campaign. So you would play the role. Everybody got together to play a game. Everybody would assume the same persona if their persona lived through the last session. Um, like, you know, you'd see you, the same thing you see in Dungeons and Dragons is this idea of the persistent reality that goes between game sessions. So even, even, uh, Jenkins, the, the the idea of creating these persistent characters is really amazing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that. It's it's so it's it's just hard to be like, you know, this one person at all. Um, I think that uh, it's just it's just it's just hard to say one person did it all. And I think it's kind of the big story is no, not just one person did it all. Um, does that make sense? I mean, try not. Yeah, it makes sense. Go on, on. Um, <sighs> yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen the full movie yet. Uh, I've only seen like parts of it. So, but it, it does okay. make sense to me uh, that you're talking about uh, because of the way, obviously, uh, it existed certainly in, in the late '70s and early '80s uh, as a collective uh, endeavor coming about from. Uh, particularly yeah. here, people in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota around uh, Wesley and Arneson and uh, uh, the other people that you uh, tracked down a lot of the people are still alive and, and interviewed them, uh, yeah. which is always, yeah. I think, the most difficult thing in history. Uh, I mean, I, I've done a little bit of oral history, but I much prefer archival documents because uh, they're easier to interrogate. You just read them and... Uh, translate them and interpret them there's no uh, they don't die on you uh, they don't uh, develop dementia on you uh, so it's uh, a whole it's a lot of easier you know, thing but, but it's diff in, in terms of uh, you know how the expression history is written by the winners and uh, and so you we're seeing a lot of people looking back and sort of I mean they're sort of history reviewing history and and starting to analyze whether certain documents have validity based on the motives that somebody who created the document might have in saying that a certain thing was a certain thing. Even Herodotus, sometimes, you know, this stuff is just well, he's Herodotus mixed is uh, not very reliable. Well, uh, certainly, much right. less so than Thucydides so, or uh, the really yeah. the first uh, historian of. Uh, that said, you had to have sources. Ibn Khaldun. So he's pretty late. He's in the, the Middle Ages, right? But a lot uh, of people would rely on early sources, and and they may just be a really spurious um, And so that was yeah, kind well, of all part sources of the are biased, including uh, including official, internal, supposedly objective state sources. Those are which form a lot of uh, yeah. the basis of political history uh, due to uh, uh, the fact that uh, they're easy to find and we uh, European history evolved around uh, this. Uh, but uh, you do a fair amount of, of both uh, uh, documentary and uh, oral history. Now, oral history is something I've done a little bit about in Central Asia and I was exposed to people much better uh, than it, but myself when I was working in Africa. Uh, but as I said, I find it difficult uh, for reasons it that I don't. I mean, if I get a document in Russian, uh, I, I translate it and I, I uh, interpret it. Uh, but it doesn't. Uh, it's not going to change it, its uh, statement on me. 
Uh, if I go and read it again, the, the words are going to be the exact same. And that often doesn't mm-hmm. happen in oral history. People will change uh, their stories over time uh, as they forget or uh, as they uh, feel more free to talk about exactly. things more, more truthfully. Uh, you have to kind of sort that out. So, so yeah. did, you, did you view this kind of as a, a oral history project of, of going and interviewing uh, people in that had been involved in uh, – Arneson Circle in the late 60s and uh, early 70s and, and uh, how did this approach uh, differ from or similar to I guess uh, how somebody say doing a, a history of uh, life in uh, Ghana in uh, the Nkrumah era from 57 to 66 interviewing people is there similarities in kind of asking these types of questions and trying to figure out Oh, how the what is the truth from these people that we're not getting from the official sources? You know, it's kind of it, it's it's even more complicated than that because I don't think we have a very strong question formulated. Um, there were some basic premises I had as far as you know, just it's like logic puzzle puzzles, you know, as to if if you know, I mean, literally like semantic puzzles of is if A is equal to B and you know, and the sort of like quest statements that I would make to myself about the origins of role playing games. Um, uh, so where am I going with that? Um, but you, so yeah, so it's like the big part was figuring out kind of what the question was. That's why it took so long was that I was doing all this research and trying to understand what was the primary question that I did be asking and really the, the the prime question would, was kind of a combination of a few things um, because it seemed like uh, there was no definition for what a role-playing game is. And there's a big... Why don't you give us your definition? Because sort of, uh, I noticed that came up on one of the uh, things uh, you ha- uh, I found on YouTube. These, those two guys from Japan, I can't remember what they're... Idle Hands? Yeah, Idle Hands uh, guys. Talked are- about... Yeah, they talked about uh, that, yeah. that, 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 how you start the documentary. So what, what is the definition of a role-playing game? Ooh, it's always a moving target for me, but my def- I guess my tendency is to avoid having a leak. Uh, like, people will hold up the way that D- Dungeons & Dragons is played, and they will say, this is a role-playing game. Okay. And then they'll say, anything that came for Dungeons & Dragons is not role-playing. And, and so my premise is like, well, we need to look at scope of, and the quantity and the scope of role playing in these games. And if we start to uh, that way, can at least measure what's there. Um, and so what my first sort of statement was that all of these games, if they use role playing, are role playing game. Um, and so I began to establish sort of a a measurement hierarchy of what role playing games are, and I could see it in the way with every game that the black that the Blackmore bunch or the the um, they're really the Blackmore bunch and, and what please group. It's all the same guys, but with every game they play, there's a, sort of a a process that they use of having to solve things. So at first they find Totten, and they realize that the what they love about uh, working. Let me step backwards. Wargaming was more like a game of chess, only you play with little lead miniatures. But it, it wasn't as much a like game of chess to say this is its own thing. It was, it's just, a, it's different, but it's the same. It's kind of like a board game. And they wanted something that was more like a real war because they realized that a lot of real battles are won before the troops that I got back field. Even choosing where to meet your enemy, forcing them to meet you somewhere that's favorable to you, or just running away from the battlefield because you don't like the, the terrain, or well, for whatever reason. Um, <clears throat> but if you read history, you always see that the generals are the ones that force their opponent into a situation that's already unfavorable from the very beginning. And so they're stacking up advantages and many advantages um, that will lead to hopefully their victory, but they're, they're looking for a favorable situation. Um, so in a, in a war game, 
you want to start looking at ideas of, well, if we set our cavalry over and at night have them attack their wagon train and destroy all their food and their resources, their, their powder, their food, their, you name it, they're not going to be able to fight a battle after a week if they have their powder or resources and will have won the war without having to fight it. Um, so they, they wanted to do things like that. That's some of the rules, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, total and, war and so, or, yeah. or, or genocide but, is uh, one way to, to win. Yeah, but it's also the idea that a player can try these things. And most, you know, if you're, uh, if I can't say, well, before the player comes to sit down at the table, I'm going to hide my cavalry over in the forest here. So I will make a play game of chess. My cavalry pieces are not on the board, or they can't see where they are on the board, but they might come out of the forest and, and surprise them and, and get a, gain a huge advantage, advantage for us. And so those are the little things they do that are very, what I consider to be role-played events. <laughs> and then um, um, it's just a role-played uh, war game stage that they go through. I get really wordy. I'm sorry. I'm trying to go through this little hierarchy. So you have you start with the war, the role-played game. Where, where would diplomacy the rules, the uh, fit in about. this? Because uh, I remember playing oh, diplomacy totally in college it. where there's a lot of... Uh, Negotiations, I guess, role playing of uh, statesmen, uh, and that's where you really win because right. uh, without alliances, uh, nobody has enough uh, actual forces on the board to, uh, you know, be able to to take anything uh, really. Yeah. Well, that's what that's the other thing they did was that once they had started doing battles using these really uh, creative ideas, where and really what that comes out of Wesley. Uh, David Wesley, he he was really into the idea of having an unbalanced game that the major forces weren't the huge force, but you had an objective that your smaller force could achieve by delaying the enemy or something like that. So then they started playing these uh, campaign games, which do stem, they, they did draw a lot from game quality or diplomatic side of it, but they were also instigating... Uh, economics and i think they were getting some of the economic concepts there's you know some of those ideas were also happening in in england in the war gaming community and there was some crosstalk between the two communities um, um so arneson was reading uh, maybe it was featherstone or somebody like that and, and a couple others from england and getting ideas from them and incorporating them to sort of the home local style and so they created the next stage which would be these these campaign games that he can make a seat, but then could break it down into battles. Um, and so they're, they're, they're scaling. There's, there's a, there's a scaling that's going on. As far as, uh, you know, if you, if you play, uh, if you're playing as the emperor of a country, you're playing that emperor and, and the things that an emperor does, the emperor doesn't go out and sail his own ships across the sea and wage a battle. Or his emperor. Um, or her admiral to go and do it for them. So there's there's a role playing aspect on a higher level there, and you have subordinates that are dealing with with uh, the more specific details. And so then, if they're if a battle were to happen, then they battle others show up to play that. Um, but anyway, so that's the next stage as they start doing these diplomatic games. Um, then it comes along and creates Brownstein, which is uh, the, an individual scale role-playing game and it's it's very different than anything else ever created because he's establishing everybody within the the sort of the world envelope of the game which is see um as a persona and each persona has an agenda an objective that they need to accomplish during the game and they resources money or some sort of secret or something and um it's it's a lot like those uh, live action games to play, you know, at parties and stuff. Um, so he came up with that idea. Uh, so that's kind of like the next stage. And then uh, Wayne Jenkins incorporated the idea of the, the ever the never ending uh, campaign game. And in some ways, there is enough document documentation to prove it or not 
but in some ways it may be entirely possible that the role we're playing as you see it in Dungeons and Dragons actually appears in Dwayne Jenkins' Brownstein or uh, Brownstone case. There's no Dwayne, unfortunately, was, uh, had suffered a stroke when we met him. He couldn't remember very much, and he passed away a few years ago. Uh, there are very few documents to show what was going on in those games, and that's where the oral history comes in. Um, one of the most liable or most interesting sources was uh, this uh, Greg Svensson talking about watching a game, and he wasn't playing. So he had to sit in with the referee while the referee had conferences with each of the players and revealed secretly what each player knew and what each player was going to do. You know, they, they were, there was an exchange there. And um, so, uh, so there's kind of like in between the stage, which I don't know if it's a stage, but it's like, did Dwayne invent the role playing game as people define it today? Um, definitely by the time Dave Arneson created his, his Blackmore game, he's implementing something different than Wesley is. Uh, the idea of the, the hidden map with the dungeon that you go through this this mysterious place, you only see what, what you've discovered as you walk along. The idea of using the map as the major tool for the experience of playing to a redemptional dungeon space um, is definitely Dave Arneson's creation. Nobody nobody doubts it. it looked, uh, the supplement published by TSR, which was the second supplement to Dungeons and Dragons, the original edition. Uh, here, I guess, praises Barneson for being the inventor of the dungeon concept. Um, and uh, which of the things in the, uh, that I try not to go into is all the drama between Dave Arnison and Gary Gygax. But um, um, you have, and there are other things like, uh, well, anyway, that's, that's well, kind uh, of. This wasn't about the the drama, but I do have a few. I have a question about, I mean, it seems if you look at the uh, Temple of the Frog coming out in mm -hmm. Blackmore Supplement, and then the first uh, published Gygax uh, adventure, uh, Caverns of Soconcha uh, from the yeah. winter time, uh, they're very different. Uh, and also, then we can also look at Tuma Horrors a little bit later on from, from, from Gygax. And, and part of it is it appears that uh, uh, <clears throat> Temple of the Frog it, it was very poorly edited by Tim Kask. He seemed to be uh, very much uh, have a relationship that was uh, very animosity towards uh, uh, Arneson. Yeah. Uh, but even yeah. so, uh, the amount of work that you have to kind of fill in uh, to uh, from the kind of clues uh, from the published version of Temple of the Frog uh, compared to uh, the first uh, published uh, adventure by Gygax. It seems to be a, 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 a lot of differences from in style. Uh, can, uh, even the, the concept, I mean, more of a, more of a, of a, almost a James Bond scenario for, for uh, Temple of the Frog versus uh uh, what uh, Gygax was producing. I mean, it's funny that you say that because you're like, you said you made D and you're like, oh, you know, I don't know that much about this stuff, but like, that's, that's the astute observation about the difference between them. The uh, Till of the Frog is really like, uh, a, a, it's, it's a, it's a raid scenario. You got to sneak in and it's a race scenario in terms of we're going to sneak up and just kill everybody. It's a. It's more almost like a spy mission oh, where you got to sneak in. Frogman. <laughs> What's that? You're gonna kill all one thousand frogs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little little problem there with my uh, my reception. Uh, there's run. You know, there's and there's a lot of debate about what the first module is, and and I always see that's another one where people like, well. Play module. It's, it isn't very clean. It's, it can't be a module. It doesn't. It's not very clean. But it is essentially what see Temple of is, is documentation of how Dave Arneson himself would run a scenario and his dungeon games. 
that he had already evolved past the point of we just go to the dungeon and run in there and kill everything and takes his, take its treasure. Um, when he plays, went to visit the Temple of the Frog. I mean, it's it's a very convoluted and long story, but uh, they're going on a show to find out what's going on in the swamp and why is, what's going on in the temple that's different because somebody new is leading the temple. And, uh, right. and so uh, it's in, and that's the difference between Arneson and Gygax is that Arneson is trying to keep this, he's modeling reality in a way, even though it's a fantasy reality and he's modeling it on every level. Mm-hmm. People, I just don't think a lot of people realize that he was modeling. He was modeling something on a larger scale because his players on point, they were building their own castles and had their own armies and that they were major forces in contributing toward King the Volvers out of Bell and they'd have big battles with their, with their armies, with lead seals, you know, lead soldiers on a, on a tabletop. They were doing plus between realms. You can see like, uh, you know, people are getting married to fictitious uh, sisters and daughters of Ripple families in this game. Uh, so it's operating on this really high level diplomatic and economic scale. And then we'll have, well, somebody, we're getting rumors and there's something weird going on down in the swamp. We need to send some people down there to investigate. So, so it comes down to the, the person, to the, the one, oh, no. the single person scale of the role playing game. I got one more question about Temple of the Frog. It came out in 75, which is the same year that Bloodstone was published by Carl Edward Wagner, uh, which also has a swamp and frog creatures and alien technology. So was there, were these just coincidences or did, was there influence one way or the other? Because uh, the, the publishing year is the same and there's a, a lot of similar themes. Uh, I would say that... Uh... What is is uh, I think that the Temple of the Frog is created earlier. Um, I don't have any real documentation when it's created, <coughs> or actually I do because I have. There's a a, a notice I think from 1973 because Dennison was documenting his campaign and he would do these uh, write ups in this in this fanzine. And there was a section, Patrician fanzine called the Blackmore Rumormonger and Gazette. And there's mention in there that um, a bunch of the players are have to go down and visit the monks of the swamp. And so that's probably as much as he wanted to reveal in the hands of the hidden from his players. Um, there are things like, uh, or like there's a great example is, is, even players that knew each other as they were playing together as teammates may not know each other's secrets. And so there were secrets winning that were never revealed to other players. And, and to this day, almost 50 years later, that most of them may not know these things. Um, but uh, like uh, we had went and interviewed John Snyder, and he was playing this character named Buzero. Buzero was a drunken warrior. And they would go on adventures and he'd be drinking. And so half of the adventure, the players would be telling him just to keep an eye on Buzero because we don't want him to get too drunk because then he can't fight at all. What they didn't know was that uh, John Snyder and Arnold got together and that Buzero would only be able to fight well if he was drunk. And so so really what they wanted to do was have Buzero extreme drunk because then he would fight as a 20th level fighter but they never figured that out. So the whole time they were trying to keep the character from getting drunk. Um, kind of, I'm, I know I'm digressing, but it's fascinating finding out all these, like you were earlier, you were asking about the secrets of Blackmore and that was one of the little tiny secrets. There's about, you know, there's 500 secrets that are like just tiny little nuggets of, of water. That Harnison was playing this game with his friends. Okay. Uh, I asked. So, so uh, what was the the, the uh, I guess biggest secret or or most interesting secret you found out <laughs> then, then? Oh, geez. Um, I don't know. It's just the accumulation of all the secrets. You know, I mean, mostly it, it comes out of um, 
there's a certain denial because of what happened with between Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax. Um, and I think that it was sort of a, a uh, I mean, it wasn't just Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax that there, there were people involved, like the Bloom brothers probably had some pressure, applied a lot of pressure. Tim Cask probably, probably applied a lot of pressure. He didn't like Arneson, didn't want him around. Um, I wouldn't know for sure. You know, it's just, I, it's like, you get a group of young people together. Yeah, we're can most of these guys, except, except for Gary and maybe Bloom, are are in their early twenties. And I think Gary was maybe five years or six years older than than Arneson or something like that. Um, but you get a cluster of people like that, and 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 suddenly the thing you're doing together starts making money. And there's a lot of pressure there, um, and so. Most of it is just that to the people who know these things, these things, talk to and this information is 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 sort of known. It's not very well organized. It's just whispered, stop whispered rumors. And so, uh, so the secrets is really just organizing that all that one information. Of the problems and that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I mean, that's not all Arneson's fault, obviously. Uh, as I said, Tim Cask uh, didn't want to do a good job of editing, but. The first publication uh, in Blackmore of uh, Temple of the Frog, much less polished than the first uh, publications of Adventures by Gygax. You can you can clearly see that uh, uh, Cask did not uh, put in uh, the, the effort uh, to uh, to bring about uh, Arneson's work as uh, being as a, a fully, I guess, uh, publishable date. Right. And well, it makes you ask the question: Was was Cask trying to make Arneson look? Uh, you know, like like I think Cask was new there. I know that he could sure make things look good in the Dragon, and he was editing the Dragon magazine. So why does the uh, Blackmore supplement look like a piece of crap? I don't know. Correct. You know. Um. Um. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I talked to him. We interviewed Tim, and he isn't in the movie because. He really wasn't there when D and D was being invented. So um, we mostly just wanted to hear sort of uh, a perspective that was maybe not so favorable toward Arnon. We got several of those, um, but uh, there wasn't there there wasn't anything from the internet for a movie about that leads up to the publication of Dungeons and Dragons, which is really that's when role playing becomes a product and everything that comes after it is just modeling the play method that you see in Dungeons and Dragons or that you sort of infer from rules in Dungeons and Dragons. Everything else is just using this, what I call the adventure game uh, of format of a role play game. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, you look at Cask, Cask was doing the dragon and that looked pretty good, pretty slick. You know, and Gary Gass publishes modules, and, and those look pretty slick. Um, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think, uh, I think they had a lot of help. You know, there was money coming in, the product was getting slicker. They were going toward a new product that was, uh, like with, I think Holmes was the first 77 Holmes and, and the, the monster manual pretty important, significant changes in how the game is being presented. Um, um, so if you could, yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what to say about, I'd hate to infer too much from that, you know? Well, I mean, I'm just destroying this out as this historical uh, fact that uh, we can look at, at these publications and we can see kind of the uh, aesthetic and, and organizational differences and, and, and part of the, the yeah. The uh, <laughs> purpose of an editor is to, to make sure that uh, those things are, are uh, kind of smoothed out before publication. Uh, so I mean, yeah. I'm not uh, necessarily pointing the finger at, at Cass. There are lots of people at TSR that uh, I consider to be uh, far worse people, including uh, the Bloom Brothers. Uh, but uh, that's mm -hmm. probably beyond the scope of uh, your movie, which I think what goes to 74. Yeah, we pretty much stopped the history at seventy four. Um, so, so before um, the downfall, no. before the denouement. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's all tragic, you know. It's like if you 
get people who made lottery tickets. And you know, one day they've got $10 million, and then five years later they've blown it all on stupid clap. And they thought it was going to change their life, but really it just made their life complicated. They might have lost friendships or discovered that somebody they thought they the camp off because the person was stealing stuff from them or what, you know, it just, I mean, really, it's just a, it's a real study. In- I think one of the in- problems you- is people particularly like Arneson and what I'm learning from, from now from you with people around him, right, they're viewing this as, as a, as an enjoyable hobby. Uh, and then people like mm-hmm. the Bloom Brothers obviously are looking at ways to make money. And, uh, uh, people often, writers, yeah. artists, uh, uh, kind of creative types, uh, often uh, are not very good with making money uh, because they're, right. they're, they're focused on making craftsmanship, a product. Mm-hmm. A- and this mm-hmm. is kind of a, a, a never-ending conflict, uh, I think. Uh, one of the reasons why you find so many people uh, starting with Carlisle back in the 18th century that are so uh, against uh, capitalism is that you know it it, it represents the the, the corporate uh, anti craftsmanship uh, kind of ideology. Right. Well, the reality of the world is you know I'm always telling you like I, people I talk to people online a lot and I'm always trying encouraging people to do things to mark you know the more you to get people to know that you exist and are doing something the better you will do you. you you, you know, if you talk to thousand people, you don't find ten people that really want to look at your painting, and out of those ten people, you might find one person that actually wants to buy your painting. Um, and so that's another. Yeah, it's like artists are really fixated on making the thing and making the thing really well. And uh, really, uh, yeah, I mean that, and that's the problem is that they're not selling themselves. I think Arneson is a really good example of that. He was a Cheese designer. Uh, the more I study what he's doing in his designs, he and Wes- Wesley. Um, um, actually, like I said, guys, there's many games that have never been published out of the Twin Cities that we're locating and that we'd like to publish some of them that really reveal how sophisticated a lot of ideas were 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and so they were just really fascinated by, by the process of creating the thing, the artistry, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Arneson, Arneson was a good, you know, he, he, uh, he doesn't strike or he, me he was never good at business, now. but he, he strikes me as, uh, being much more over in this craftsman artistic type of mentality. Uh, the, the product is what important, yeah. not the profit from the product. Yeah. I don't talk a lot with the movie. We didn't really go into my, into, Day per now because it's sort of like if you get it from me, that's kind of already third hand. So that's just an interpretation from me and never at him. But as far as being right, a researcher, I'm, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just kind of like fitting well, it just, into kind of general development of world international capitalism. That obviously uh, right. is not anything unique, right? But we shouldn't be surprised that they would stick a tentacles even into uh, role playing hobbies. You know. How can we 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 corporatize and uh, make money uh, at the expense of everything else out of this little thing here, right? You know, they, they wrap our, our right, <laughs> the right. tentacle around it. Well, what I, I, I want to come back to that. So remind me of that. Um, well, I just said no. It's and for the big company, you know, uh, Dungeons and Dragons now is a commodity, and I think that people there's a it's hard to explain to people that it was this cottage industry and it was this thing that, yes, it was a product, but it was a product I like we're buying it a friend. I mean, when they've sold only 10,000 copies, these are the kind of people you can write a letter to and say like, I am kind of cool, but in this age, there's like something weird there. Can you explain it to me? You know, and they write you a letter back, you know, maybe a month later, you'd get a letter saying like, well, this is what we're doing with it. This is how we run that rule. Um, they were very accessible. And it, and it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was just this whole game organ industry was right. in a lot of ways. I, um, I think mentality wise, they fall into the kind of more artisanal rather than corporatist uh, or capitalist uh, 
kind of mindset, uh, to put it uh, it's in this term. Yeah, it's very individualistic. You know, uh, even with playing war games, I think people think that war gamers just buy the war game and play it. I can find very many war gamers that don't look at a war game they've played and go like, yeah, I don't know, man, that that canon accuracy chart, you know, I did this for research. Really, the, the Austrian Navy didn't really have well-trained, you know, you can look at the guns and they're just the same. Yeah. Uh, the crews weren't trained as well. And so they really shouldn't be as accurate. And we really should modify the chart for when the Austrians are attacking, you know, some Austrians attacking with their ships or something like that. And that's, that's very much a, a part of the, the game or culture. And so now it's, it's, uh, you know, as a product, it, it is a brand, the big ampersand, that's the registered trademark ampersand. Um, it's the Adidas of, of role-playing games. And uh, it's just, a, it's, it's entered a different phase because it's been bought by a giant company. And, and that's what happens with products. That's how capitalism works. It's just, it's just the way it works. Um, but as to like what I was talking about, the personalities, um, it is interesting to, have studied Dave Arneson so much and really feel like I have gotten, I, I know his friends so well, and I've heard so many stories about Dave. I've watched some of his friends do impersonations of Dave. I've got something like 14 hours of Dave Arneson talking on video that we used in some clips in the, in the movie. Um, <clears throat> and so there's this real, uh, I have a real sense for, for who he is as a person. Um, and I don't know if I can really convey that to anybody else, but that's something I think a lot of, I'm always curious, you know, anybody who does a documentary about a historical person that's passed away must hit a point where they're like, like, wow, I feel like I'm getting inside this person's head, you know? Um, and uh, it's just an odd experience. It's just to, to have that experience, you know, um, it's, it's an observation. Let's just say that it's an observation. Okay, uh, but it, it it does seem, I guess, uh, perhaps. Uh, do, do you see in this group uh, of gamers, Minneapolis, that it did kind of have a craftsman or, or guild like or, or artisanal kind of of uh, uh, mentality, kind of a throwback to uh, you know, pre-industrial, pre-capitalist. Uh, Right. mindset is regarding as to, to, to how they approached uh, uh, it initially before uh, obviously TSR under the Bloom Brothers and, and Wizards of the Coast are, are, are fully capitalist but uh, there's a period of time right. before then obviously uh, where it doesn't seem like that well I think that's the difference between uh, you look at the new edition of Dungeons and Dragons I'm sure they did a ton of playtesting where they were not necessarily looking at gamers and what gamers wanted. They were just looking at, or they might've had different groups. You know, they had people who had never played a role-playing game play it and they were trying different things out. And so the design process is really coming from uh, 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 user satisfaction factors um, to, in, to increase sales volumes. Um, whereas you look at how the game starts with Wesley and he runs this thing and he thinks it's a complete failure. The first game he ran, he thought he screwed it all up and everybody else was like, this is off. You know, this is, this is so cool. We've never played anything like this and this is awesome. We got to do this again. And so he goes off and tries to figure out how to do it. And he has some failed games where he tries to, to control the players too much. And then he comes back and he says, he said he had a, a, a just a stroke of genius and he realized the thing I did in the first game was I just let them do whatever they want and they just went nuts. Right. So let's just do that. And that's what the game, that's what the role playing game is going to be as far as he's concerned. Um, and I think Ar Arneson probably went through some stages like that with his players too, but the, the design is really coming from a, a real personal place of I'm going to invent a story. I'm going to invent this magical world called Blackmore for my friends to play in and then, um, you know, and they might add some ideas of their own and that's fine. And, and 
we're, we're just going to do this thing and we don't really have any rules. We'll just keep changing the rules and trying different things to see what works and what, what makes everybody happy. Um, but it's very much, a, a, a it's so homemade and, and, and personal as opposed to once it starts being a product. Um, I've been, I've been Nick running. Adventures. Buy yeah. our Mick Adventures. Would you like fries? And, and, Mick fries with your Mick Adventures. Yeah, I think that's and so uh, I mean that's one of the things. There's a whole movement of gamers called the they call themselves the old school renaissance. Yeah, uh, OSR. And it's, it's, yeah, the OSR, and it's problematic. I guess there was one guy that was in it that that produced some game that was just uh, you know sexist and and racist and horrible, and so now everybody's dubbed the OSR as as being that guy and really what the osr is about is this this do-it-yourself homemade you know i can play my game like sure i'll go buy the basic books but once i've got the framework there i can do whatever i want with it and it's my game and i'm going to change the rules according to what i think they should be and uh and then i'm going to create my own settings so nobody so because i don't like what they make because it's just not it's just not half as creative as what I could produce myself anyway. Well, um, I, you probably have a different uh, view than me because you're a bit older, but looking it back kind of historically, it looks like uh, the, 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 the real move from kind of sandbox play to railroad play comes with the publication of uh, Ravenloft. And so uh, as much as... Uh, they may be good storytellers, uh, the, the, the couple of uh, Tracy and Laura Hickman uh, uh -huh. really deviated uh, from kind of the earlier ideas of uh, Gygax and others as far as uh, uh, allowing players to, to, to kind of move wherever they wanted within a given scenario rather than kind of putting them on the train and uh, deporting them to the uh, uh, destination. Right, right. Well, you know, it's funny because I just ran a game and I thought I would try a new experiment and I, I totally railroaded my players. Um, and so, uh, and I thought they wouldn't like that, but because I was providing them with such a unique experience that this talking to is this whole storytelling thing and, and, and that particular kind of role playing actually so sort of like a horror view where that nothing is happening and nothing is happening and you're winding the clock and then all hell breaks loose. And so I was doing that. Thing. I, I railroaded them, but I was filling them with information about what was to come. And I, and I was setting things up for them about what was, you know, their job was and, uh, and what they could expect. And then I cut them loose. And, and by that point they were just loving the game. Um, I don't know. It's, I think that the, the big thing, it's not, it's not about railroading. I think that the big thing is, and it, and it happened really early on, when Jeskiel started releasing material for Dungeons and Dragons, um, they were producing really cool stuff, and they created other uh, wilderness of high fantasy, wilderlands of high fantasy, and they created, uh, what was the other one? The City State of the Invincible. Or, oh, or they all those over. Yeah. The but you. What you yeah, the, the, but what you got to understand, of the, yeah, and city that was also the mansion of, of Pigler with the judges' guild. What's that? And also, was it Tegler Mansion with the judges' guild? Oh, Teagle Mansion. Yeah, Teagle yeah. Mansion. Yeah, yeah, Teagle Manor. Manor. Yeah, and that's actually a really highly developed uh, scenario. It's got a town. It's got the manor. It's got stories that can, can develop and grow from there. Um, so it was just, I mean, that stuff was just amazing to look at. And so a lot of gamers get sucked into the sort of uh, the published product, just the look of the published product, because we're all doing it. At that time, everybody's with guns on a paper with a pencil, and, and half of us aren't doing a very good job of it either because we're not very artistic. So you think they're beautiful and they're, and they're just fascinating to read because you can learn so much from studying them, even if you don't run them. Um, so there's that aspect. I mean, a lot of people, I guess, don't know how to invent their own story or create their own thing. Um, 
don't know. I don't want to go into that because I feel like if you if you're enjoying doing what you're doing, that's fine. You know, if you I don't know if you're say a doctor or something and you work ridiculous hours, but you want to get off work and go to your friend's house and run a module and run him, your friend, and a couple other friends through it because and but you haven't had time to work on, you know. RPG, it's fun. I mean, you're ready to go, but um, it really began with Judges Guild, and so there was a discovery that pre mating was something that people wanted, but there was also a real homemade quality to Judges Guild, and there was a real open open opportunity uh, to the Judges Guild as far as they had the Judges Guild journal. You could write them letters. You could write them. You could send them a copy. Your Jenny push it there. Um, so there was just. I mean, it was it was sort of like a like a paper internet of D and D stuff in the just because there was a lot of garbage in there, but um, there was, it was a very open exchange of ideas. Um, TSR noticed that, and that's when they decided. I mean, they really they they didn't understand discussions with TSR about modules and pre created dungeons. Um, they didn't. They couldn't really comprehend why they want to buy something that was pre-made because they thought that half the fun is making the dungeon up or making the town up or making the wood up. Right. Um, but then they discovered that you can sell a lot of units. <laughs> and, and, and if you... If you if you yeah, even you so, Mag, a lot of the ones that they sold... Uh, for instance, uh, D1 uh, through D3 is a good example. Uh, there's a lot right. of it that's not filled in. I mean, you, you, most of it is left up to the GM, uh, the DM, or referee, however you want to call it, to, to fill in if you look at uh, just uh, what, you know, the blanks that are left on the maps. Right. I think that was a style early on. I mean, I think that. I, see, I don't know the, the TSR stuff at all. I don't really study it. Um, not interested in it. Um, a lot of people, I, I get into trouble because I, I'm like, once they advanced Dungeons and Dragons appears, I didn't want to play it anymore because I like. Uh, I found it like, really restricting as a game anymore, and I found that that the players I was encountering as a dungeon master were me to run my game because they wanted me to do it all by the book, and I just didn't want to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a personal opinion thing there, but um, um, I think that's a, with well, the I mean, OSR. It, it, it goes uh, in stages, I suppose, but uh, the, the, the point would be that uh, a lot of the stuff that Gygax published early on still had uh, kind of this remnants of uh, do-it-yourself. So, I mean... Uh, this idea right. of, of kind of just half half finished uh, adventures with the rest to be filled in uh, was pretty much standard uh, up until uh, you know the early '80s or so. So the, the stuff in the late '70s, early '80s was still uh, at least had a portion of this. Uh, okay, here's a, a framework, but you know you gotta you gotta fill in most of it yourself. Yeah. Um, appendix. I mean, it, it's it's complicated. It is, uh, Gygax talks a lot about early on. He talks a lot about doing it all yourself, and it's it's. I mean, even the original Dungeons and Dragons. It's like these these rules are guidelines for you to do your own thing. It says it in there. Um, and you get to the stage where selling a lot of modules and stuff, and so they're really trying to push product, and maybe, and it's not necessarily even Gary, but they're presenting this. Based on more, like, you've got to play the game exactly the way it's written in the book, and you've got to buy our modules and play in a, you know, the D, the world of Greyhawk, and the two become one. Um, so if you're going to play D and D, you're going to play in the world of Greyhawk because these are they, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, later in life, he kind of changes the, his tone. Um, um, I don't know. I mean. I, I, you know, it's hard if you're selling, if you're, if you're running a company and you're selling a lot of product and you got like, move it down, like, you know, just hole in the wall. And it's just a miserable hole in the wall from what I hear back in the day. 
Um, and so, so you guys come so you guys this, this tiny town, you're bringing in millions of dollars. Everybody in the town is benefiting from the new paper. And the guy that owns the bar shop or the guy that owns the restaurant from the fact that people are working at your factory, loading boxes with games, send them all over the world. Um, you know, so so as far as Lake Geneva is concerned, Gary, I guess, laid gold egg for the entire town. Uh, so he's not going to. He's not going to tell you, like, you don't need to buy our modules and you don't buy that. All you need is maybe the basic three hardbound books and some graph paper and your imagination because at a certain degree, you're marked saturation and everybody who's interested in role playing will have those three books. And now suddenly you're not selling any books at all. Um, I mean, that's been really pragmatic about that process. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of something look at when you get things like that is 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 just the reality of you know you got to put food on the table, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't know where I'm going with that, but but that is that is sort of like the official the official word from TSR game. But yeah, we have the coolest things on the planet, and you need to buy them. Right, and. At that really point. Now we have an advertisement. So you can see my Patreon down here. If you want to uh, see me do uh, more shows uh, interesting like this or, or like uh, I did with uh, Lena Wolf, uh, contribute money. This is the book manuscript I finished. I'm, I'm just down to editing and the footnotes, and then I'll start sending it out to publishers. But it is done, basically. So it's uh, hopefully... Uh, oh. My editing would be better than Tim Cask's editing of the Temple of Frog. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, that's my that's, fourth book. She's talking to game. I was talking to a game publisher, and, and uh, he was commiserating because we're doing a game book, and it's safer. Uh, well, this, this isn't was, a game book. This is a, a historical book, but uh, the footnotes but, are killing me. Yeah, I, I've got 750 footnotes, and I, I'm... Uh, I have to go through and and make sure they're all all correct here, and uh, it's uh, it's, it's taking me a lot longer than writing the actual text. Right, it's that last one percent when you're going through the details that will kill you. The writing was probably not as hard as what you're doing now. Uh, well, it certainly was more interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not fun. Then it becomes work when you're trying to get it. All just everything, all your ducks. So it, it becomes really brutal. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't know. We've been kind of speculating about TSR and and it's like, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about relating to the movie? Or I know we yeah, talked earlier uh, about soccer. I don't have anything. Well, but you can, you any, can, anything, you, into anything you want to say about the movie, go ahead and uh, plug it. Uh, or uh, uh, okay, uh, there's sort of nothing to plug. You, you Anything you think is uh, particularly interesting? Um, well, we can move on to football. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we can move on to football. I don't have a lot to say about football um, except for the last season, you know, losing a whole season of soccer is really painful for me. Um, I, I'm kind of like trying to get back into it, but it's sort of weird because it, it's just an empty stadium a lot with NAB, and you can hear just the stadium echoing. And, and there isn't that energy of watching the game on TV and you hear the crowd or it's, it's more like this session a lot of times uh, it was what it, the experience is. I haven't is. watched a, a game in a while, but uh, yeah. I, I do, did watch the last World Cup when I, and I was still in Sulemania then. Uh, okay. But uh, perhaps uh, make the connection here. Uh, one thing... Uh, it really it didn't dawn on me until my my second academic job, so it, it didn't come up in Kyrgyzstan, where I worked for 2007 to 2010, because the football isn't the big sport there. The big sports are, are wrestling, uh, particularly Greco-Roman and some other martial arts, so Taekwondo, uh, Judo. Uh, but when I moved to mm -hmm. Ghana, it was a huge sport, and we had a, uh, once a semester a history seminar devoted to sports, which meant football and national development. Uh, so 
So some of the uh, papers were on Ghana and Nkrumah built the Black Stars as a way specifically of nation building and got support from East Germany uh, and Czechoslovakia regarding coaching and the players. They sent them over to uh, Warsaw Pact countries to, to train. Uh, and this is done with some other uh, post-colonial African states as well. Uh, certainly uh, one of the things you notice, Kurdistan does not have, have its own football team. So the, there's an Iraqi team that has Kurds on it. Uh, but uh, they right. don't, uh, they, unlike, uh, say, uh, Ireland, which has a united uh, rugby team, there's, there's no Kurdish team, uh, which I told them was the, one of the reasons why they still were not independent. They needed a single Kurdish national football team to rally around. Well, even if everybody disagreed politically, at least you could agree on sports. But instead, they, you know, they, right. some of them support uh, uh, Catal uh, Catalonia, Barcelona, because the Catalans are against the Spanish. So there's a lot of fans of Barcelona and then a lot right. of fans of Real Madrid on the other side. You know, it's funny because it, it's, uh, well, you've got Guyana's so great in the World Cup where they, I think it was the one before the pre, the, the most recent one, and they, they were in the, they have not good facts, but they got really far, and then they got robbed by the, uh, I want to say it was the Argentinians. It was Suarez who no it was, was that, wasn't that, it was Argentina? It might have been Argentina. I thought Suarez was, thought Ar it was Argentina. Uruguay. Oh, maybe it was no, Argentina. Uruguay. It was. I know it was Suarez, and I forget who he plays for. Um, anyway, he did that handball to the goal, and then the, the Ghanaian player just flubbed it. I mean, he was just exhausted, and he his his forte is in penalty. He didn't make it, and so they, they were knocked out at that point. And uh, it was just such a horrible robbery of, of a great African team. And I, I predict that in the next... I don't know, maybe 12 years, we're going to see an African team win the World Cup. Like, I think yeah, but it's probably, unfortunately, it will not be Ghana. It, it might be Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, Nigeria, maybe, yeah. Well, uh, Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, both in terms of people, and now both because the, the population is larger, but also because of economic decline. Its GDP is bigger than South Africa, so... Yeah. Well, it's like, interesting. It's interesting sport because you can have these sort of sleeper teams. Um, I know, like a lot of gamers aren't into to soccer or any sport whatsoever. But sport to me is drama and story. It's like a it's a morality play. You pick even if you know teams, you pick jersey color that you like, and you say that's my team, and the other guys are evil and they're Satan. Yeah, you know? right. Which is why <laughs> it works so well. Uh, as a f way of unifying uh, fractured nations. So this is why the, the Black Stars literally were created by Nkrumah as a way of unifying an ethnically divided Ghana into a single kind of nation. So if nothing else, Ewe and Asante and Ga and uh, Dogamba could all say, well, we all support the Black Stars against the... Uh, uh, you know, other football teams, and that makes us Ghanaian uh, in that sense, and that's a, a value higher than uh, ethnic loyalty. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I think we're going to they look at the European teams, and um, the greatest, you know, some of the greatest players are from from Africa. They're not directly from Africa. You have great. Well, people will argue whether Balotelli is a great player or not, but I love Balotelli, and he you know, in Italy, and he's probably more Italian than I am, even though I was born there. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he's, I mean, he's, he's thinking about Africa and everything good about Italy, and he, and he played a great soccer game. I don't know how he's going to be doing in the future, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I love soccer. So, you know, what I wanted to bring about is how it's kind of connection. Then, of course, to back to uh, football is, 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 of course, uh, the, the, the game that everybody loves uh, in, internationally uh, for most yeah. countries. Kyrgyzstan was a, a kind of an exception. 
not really being into football uh, or good at it, but certainly in Ghana and in Kurdistan, I noticed that the uh, very uh, strong support, although there's no Kurdish football team uh, and no Kurdish politician has the vision or uh, intelligence to create one, uh, unlike in Kruma, yeah. in Ghana. Uh, but uh, this idea I brought up uh, on the show sometime before, I, I'm not sure if it's uh, ever been uh, talked about elsewhere, the idea that uh, as we were talking over the role playing game, being kind of uh, a American artifact, uh, particularly in the Midwest region of the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, and in that some sense is uh, being uh, very much part of the kind of American apple pie culture that develops in the twentieth century. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's significant that you see. Uh, um, what is that? Uh, like the games and afford very quickly, and so so a lot of countries were sort of behind on getting editions, and of course they had problems with translations things like that. Um, but I've started since we did the movie, we we got all these fans because the movie is about the roots of the game. And so they're crazy. They're sort of like in their their basic their their like original D and D stage of the game. Um, and so they have movements where they really support the sort of uh, the, the real homemade old style of play. So I've been in a lot of places like I met a bunch of guys in Poland, really nice guys, and I've been I've been communicating with them, um, which is strange. You know, I'm like I'm in Colorado, and I'm I'm meeting these guys in Poland that are just totally into role playing games, and and uh, and I've got friends. Them. Um, just last night, I played. I mean, it's sort of funny because we're talking about soccer. I met all these Brazilian guys online, right? So you think Brazil soccer's got to be the big thing? I don't think any of them give a snot about soccer. They're totally into role playing games, and I met them, and they were just ecstatic you know, and to be able to play with me. Um, I was ecstatic to be able to play with them. Oh, they speak English. I, speak, I can understand some of it because I speak it Italian fluently. Um, it's kind of similar um, in some ways, kind of completely different in other ways. But I've studied enough languages. I've studied Spanish. I've studied French. Um, you know, you do like a couple semesters of Spanish college or a couple semesters of French in college, and you get a basis in those languages. So Portuguese is kind of between my Italian, Spanish, and French. I can sort of understand what there's what they were saying to each other, but they spoke English. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think role playing games really are. Uh, it's funny because I, we're we're being so uh, on the internet, being divisive about role playing games. I see a lot, and when really it should be very, uh, uh, it should bring people together a lot more. <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm sort of on a campaign to promote the idea of getting back to the the roots style role playing where you have. All you have is basic Dungeons and Dragons set and everything else you make up yourself and you don't need rules to deal with uh, with anything because you have a referee there and that's the referee's job is to, to decide and make judgments and, and the players just have to deal with it. You know, it's, yeah, my character died, I guess I'll roll up another one, but you know, my, my referee is always fair with me and that time I really stop. I do so I'll get in a character going and you just keep keep playing um um i'm trying to take a lot of the stuff that you know i'm trying to promote but it's sort of interesting because i've gone from being the guy that made the chris i remain talking to other important chris but um going from being sort of the D, &D historian guys to being really hands-on in the area i want to promote the, the old ways of playing and and there are really fundamental differences in the play style between how people play and how people used to play. I'm not saying it's 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 better or worse, but it would be nice to see more people preserving the old way. Uh, because I think that there's a there's just a difference and 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 uh, I feel like that that always sort of to be preserved and handed down to other generations as just sort of a, a, a more a 
highly developed form of make-believe, let's say. Um, but um, I don't know. What else did we want to talk about? Dr. Finley talked about role-playing. Um, is there? Did you have any other questions or... or uh, ah. I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, I suppose uh, the problem here is, of course, uh, that uh, having this been done on such a short uh, notice, I, I haven't actually seen your movie, so I can't uh, have... Uh, I haven't had been able to uh, craft specific questions aimed at the, your uh, particular work. Right, right. Um, right. Well, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else. Like, did I want to cover anything? I, I just worry that I get really wonky when I start talking about like, old game research stuff. And oh, that's I think okay. Uh, YouTube is the place for detailed, obsessed. Uh, uh, yeah. people to talk <laughs> tiny uh, obsessive details uh, on things nobody else cares about I put camera on so that if anybody joined late they can see that yeah this is indeed Griff on the show and it'll probably bog down the feed and my audio will at least um, how are you doing so far <laughs> is it is it holding doing up good yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, do you, is there a live audience? Did anybody that's watching? I know that you with YouTube, you yeah, can have uh, a, like a uh, dozen people watching. Oh, do you have any questions? Or do uh, I know already? I mean, it might be a lot of my friends know, these from are, uh, social well, media. They're all my people. Uh, oh, really? I mean, people I got people from from California, people from Quebec. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I know where everybody is from, but I recognize most of these uh, pseudonyms. Uh, so okay, uh, yeah, we've even got one woman that's been in the chat. I'm gonna turn off my camera again because I'm losing. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a smaller audience than I normally get, but I'm not sure if that. Is your fault or my fault or the day's fault or, or what? Uh, not that anything yeah, yeah. about you said is, is bad quality, but I think maybe the, the topic uh, is not uh, right. your uh, audience of interest to, to yeah. everybody. Yeah. Well, I don't know, we were kind of circling a lot of like really technical stuff earlier, and, and um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I like sort of missed while we were talking. Um, but really it's like one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that, uh, I mean, like it, and I think it applies to someone like you. I mean, you're a professional academic, but we're all kind well, of off. Well, of well it wasn't one our time. Um, the job market seems to have collapsed with COVID. So the number of jobs to apply to has like gone down like 97% since uh, the COVID crisis. So be a What? So, so you're saying don't don't get a degree to be a college professor? Well, I would have said that long ago, especially not a PhD in history. But it's it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, yeah. So b before the COVID thing, uh, I don't know. There, were, I applied to 125 jobs, uh, and I got three interviews, including I almost I almost made it to Normandale Community College position uh, in uh, Minneapolis. So I could have uh, been with all your uh, Oh wow, uh, Arn Arn some people. Yeah, but uh, now I, I notice there's like been like less than twelve jobs since August uh, for the entirety of <laughs> the world advertised on uh, that are uh, anything I can apply to. Right, right. Um, ish, ish. Yeah, but that was what I was going to say about the sort of the independent researcher thing. I mean. Uh, uh, I'll just keep them and lay on our whatever our little personal interest is, you know. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you this thing is here, but it's like you're you're entering the dialogue, and so people will will find your book and read it, and and perhaps cite future writings saying either that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, or this guy is totally on it and knows what he's talking about. Uh, I think that's a really exciting aspect of, of getting involved in historical research is that you do become part of this continuum and 
that you feed that river of information? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, some uh, disciplines have, like, disappeared. So I, I've noticed... Oh, really? Uh, well, I've noticed, for instance, you can't find any place advertising to teach Central Asian history anymore. Uh, so there was a couple uh, advertisements I saw that said... Uh, wanted somebody to teach Asian history open to South Asian, East Asian, and Southeast Asian history, but they left out Central Asia. So Central Asia is no longer considered part of the study of Russian history, and then, but it was never added to Asian history, so it just kind of disappeared as a disciplinary uh, subject in uh, higher academia. Maybe. Maybe other places they still do. Uh, Central Asia they do, but not even all the places, because not every place in Central Asia has uh, history departments. Historians are considered uh, too dangerous for a lot of places. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is a history department at uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev University in Astana. You know, it's funny because uh, Arneson had a history degree. That's what his yeah didn't uh, that's what his interest didn't, was. Uh, Barker as well, the guy who did the uh, Empire of the Petal Throne was a PhD in in linguistics, but oh, okay. he I, I guess that because of linguistic background, he was also sort of an anthropologist. And uh, if you've seen Empire of the Petal Throne, it's just an astounding. It's a history and create a fantasy world to play in. Uh, uh, a historian and an anthropologist, maybe an archaeologist, got together to create a realistic fantasy world to play in, and uh, that's yeah, that's still one of the astounding games. I'm always pushing that, like Cobbett. If you know, yeah, get a copy of Empire of the Petal Throne and read it. It's amazing. Yeah, it never caught amazing. on for a number of reasons. One of which was it was too complex, I think, but also it was too expensive. Yes. Yeah, it was outright weird. Yeah, oh, damn. He, he, um, and that's one of the problems because this is a guy thinking like a craftsman, so like the best product possible. But of course, uh, you can't like sell lots of the best product. How many people can afford, you know, to have the uh, the, the the best uh, crafted uh, whatever? I mean, that that becomes too expensive for most of the the middle class. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like we've kind of like I, I've. Feel I'm getting energy steam here. We've been going right. for what an hour and a half. Yeah, you can free. Okay. Um, uh, I don't... Yeah. Uh, so thank you for coming on. And, yeah. Let me. Uh, uh, Is I it hope, just going to uh, automatically? No, no. I'm gonna. Um, you, 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 if you go to leave studio and you will remove yourself from the uh, uh, program. And that's all you have to do. All right. Well, hey, thanks you for, see where for doing it. a little orange, orange uh, X that says Leave Studio? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If you hit that, Alrighty. and you, you boot yourself. And uh, that's, uh, I prefer that guests see themselves out rather than me expelling them. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I didn't know if you wanted to end the show for and then expelling uh, you. I, I don't know if I'm going to end it or not, uh, but uh, you are free to leave, and uh, I, I thank you very much for coming on uh, to uh, discuss yeah. uh, things yeah. uh, that normally aren't discussed here, but uh, I think getting into echo boxes uh, is a, a problem, people just talking right. about the same thing over and over again. Right, right, right. All righty. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I hope so. Somebody- no, no problem. There it was. And uh, um, and we'll talk again. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks, Otto. So, uh, you too, Griffith. I will, I will wave goodbye. That's my hand waiting, waving over the camera. All right, bye bye. Thanks. All right, see you later. All right, Griffith Morgan, uh, independent filmmaker. Uh, and uh, one of the two people behind Secrets of Blackmore documentary in 2019, his, uh, which was his latest uh, film to come out. All right, so uh, I'm going to put my uh, information in the chat if anybody else wants to come on and discuss anything. Uh, I was on uh, Robert Dugan's show. 
uh, the other day, uh, Thursday, Thanksgiving, uh, talk about uh, Soviet uh, racial policies and uh, socialism in Africa. And uh, so if you want to bring up anything from that show, you know, those subjects, uh, there's a, uh, feel free to as, do that as well. If you, if you want to come on, send me an email or a uh, uh, DM. Let me get into Twitter here. Godward podcast is a hundred percent male viewers. No female listen. No women listen to Godward podcast. Evidently, uh, so I may just wrap this up. Been going ninety minutes and. Uh, doesn't look like uh, anybody else is going to come on to uh, fill in now that uh, Griffith has uh, signed out. Uh, and uh, we have ended the discussion on uh, filmmaking, uh, role-playing games, and football. So we can move on to other topics. If anybody wants to send me a, a message, uh, I'm not an expert on Moby Dick, but uh, even that topic is open for discussion. All right, so I'll give it exactly eight more minutes. Uh, which would bring me to the 100-minute mark. And if uh, nobody wants to uh, join me, uh, then I'll call it a night or actually a week. Uh, next show will be next Saturday. Uh, and uh, I'll thought of something to come up with. Uh, Perhaps uh, more on polyarchy imposition, uh, particularly in Latin America by the U.S. Uh, first uh, place it was imposed was uh, Chile, uh, and then uh, Nicaragua, and then Haiti. Uh, the three big examples uh, in the Western Hemisphere, but uh, also the Philippines. Uh, and probably also could be uh, uh, looked at as a model for what happened uh, in South Korea and to a lesser extent, Taiwan. Uh, love from Islamic states of Bangladesh. Okay. We could discuss Bangladesh, but uh, God loves other people more. I'm not sure what that means. Might be missing something here. I'll give it six more minutes. Anybody wants to join me? Maybe we could even discuss boxing.
<laughs> God word. Yes. Uh, if God word wants to come on, God word podcast, he is free to do so. Just let me know and I'll send a uh, an invite. To him. In the meantime, five more minutes until I will uh, <laughs> uh, sign out. Uh, I don't know if I have much to say about Bangladesh. It, it broke off from Pakistan in 1971 and became an uh, independent state. VP is Bangladeshi. I don't know who VP is. The uh, only thing I can think of off of recent history of Bangladesh is uh, Operation Searchlight by the Pakistani military to try and prevent uh, Bangladeshi independence by uh, killing large numbers of Bangladeshis. But, uh... I will probably just wrap it up. So four more minutes. Give the last chance for anybody who wishes to come on and uh, say their piece. Or not say their piece. In which case, I'll just, uh, I said, uh, leave it at a 100-minute mark. And uh, come back next week. Uh, with something uh, completely different, uh, completely uh, uh, opposite of tonight's discussion with Griffith Morgan. In the meantime, everybody, I hope, had a Happy Thanksgiving if you were in the U.S. For those of you outside the U.S., uh, I suppose it's just another weekend. Uh, but uh, for the U.S., it's uh, one of the most uh, important holidays of the year. So hopefully yes, uh, the day before yesterday was uh, good for everybody. All right. All right. Looks like I'm going to wrap it up for the last 60 seconds here. The final, final, final last call. And then uh, I will go, I will, I will log out. So you won't have to go home, uh, but you won't be able to, to stay here.
Okay, so thank you very much. Everybody showed up. Uh, I know the, the topic. Uh, no, dessert has not arrived yet, King Kush. It's just nobody. I got nothing to, to say uh, uh, prepared beyond uh, the interview with uh, Griffith. So if I'm not going to get somebody else on here to introduce the new subjects of discussion. I'm going to wrap it up here at the 100-minute mark. Uh, and do something else until dessert arrives. So, again, thank you, everybody who did show up for showing up. And uh, with those of you who uh, wanted a topic more in line with uh, usual topics of uh, history in Europe uh, and the Soviet Union during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, we'll be returning to our uh, normally scheduled broadcast uh, itinerary, I don't know, schedule, I guess is the word, program, <laughs> normal program uh, next week. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to be out of here. We're at 100-minute mark, and uh, nobody's uh, coming uh, to uh, introduce uh, new subjects of discussion. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, for those of you who did like uh, Griffith Morgan, uh, that's good. And if not, uh, it's always good to kind of expand uh, beyond echo chambers, even if uh, it's not a complete and total success. So uh, I'll leave you at that. I'll see you next week.